Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. Before we get started, I just want to do a little bit of a disclaimer because we're going to talk about sort of my journey into reaching my unaliving age. And if you guys are sort of struggling or contemplating unaliving yourself, I hope that this podcast is a optimistic message of hope because I am now at that age. I'm 35 today. And I am excited to be alive. I want to be alive. I made the decision a few years ago to stay alive. And so I want this to be a positive thing for you. If you do need help, I'm going to put some resources in the description. And then at the end of this podcast, I hope that you have one more reason to keep on going. With that said, I am drinking a mixture of coconut milk, strawberry tea that I freshly brewed, fresh mint, and freshly squeezed orange juice. And let me tell you, it is a vibe I recommend. So today's story is a good one, a positive one. It was a struggle to get here, but I'm here. And I think that's sort of what is important and what I want you to focus on. Every time someone talks about unaliving on the internet, every time we talk about these things, it is difficult to really convey the message of hope that I think is so hard to hear when you are hopeless. And as somebody who is hopeless a lot of her life, it was amazing to reach the point where I figured it out. What I'm saying is, and why I'm sharing this with you, is I want to give you perspective. And I want to tell you that as a person that used to judge consistently and hardcore and would never budge, I have learned to budge. I have learned to take people for who they are and what they show me they are. I have learned to be patient. But that's because I've learned to be humble. And I don't mean obviously like in the Mother Teresa way. But I mean I've, you know, spent so many nights crying into my pillow. And I've learned that I'm just some stupid human being in a world where life is a game. And some players in this game are hard fucking core. And I don't always win. And sometimes I lose and sometimes I'm really, really sad about it. But I want just, I just, I don't, I don't know. All I'm saying is that I am pursuing happiness, my happiness, because I want to be a novelist. And the way to do that is to starve for the next 10 years, which is something so hard to come, like, I, I guess to really, like, understand. But I've chosen a path that is going to leave me struggling for the next decade. And the only reason I'm okay with that is because I know it brings me true happiness to sit down and write. And I know it's the only thing I want to do. And life is really worthless without it. And because I believe in the happiness of an individual is based off the individual and not even the people in the individual's life, writing is something that is me. It's inside of me. Relationships and everything else we create is outside of me. The people I bond with, even my family members who I love to my core and would die for, they're not my reason for existing. And I don't have kids. And I probably, to be honest, will never have kids. So they can never be my reason for existing. My reason for existing is my pursuit of, like, my pursuit of my happiness. And once I have happiness, hopefully contentedness. But that is my struggle. And that is what I've chosen to do with my life. And there are other paths I've, I could take. But none, none of those paths will bring me true happiness. So yes, as I sit here and I complain that I have no money, and that is not for sympathy but for understanding, I have chosen to give up the material things for the one thing that brings me true joy and reason for existence. It might be foolish, it might be naive, but at least I'm pursuing what will make me happy. I am pursuing my happiness. Can you say the same? Can you honestly say the same? Because there are so many people in my life that have told me I've given up on my dream because it doesn't pay the bills. And I understand that. I honestly do. Because being late on bills sucks. And going through your stupid bedroom looking for $1. ten for pasta it sucks. Living off cereal sucks. Getting a parking ticket at the worst possible moment sucks. But as human beings in this vast, beautiful world, 
We have to literally decide what we want to spend our time, money, effort, energy, and life on. And I want to spend mine on writing. And I will starve for that dream. As stupid as that is, and as much as it makes me cry at night, and as much, it is, whoa, say I'm fumbling, but this, the idea of being able to write helps with those tears. Does that make sense? Does that sound stupid? I don't know. I'm going to post this video without editing it because it seemed more honest that way. And see, it turned out to be a sad video. I tried to make it happy. It was so hard. Thank you for watching and judging me and making fun of the fact that I wear the same clothes. Because yes, the reality dawns on me when I read those comments and I'm like, I do wear the same clothes. I am poor. I am a poor person. How sad for me. But how cool that I've managed to barely live off $2 a week on food. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna go now. And figuring it out is gonna look so specific to you. So if you hear me telling my story and you think like this doesn't resonate with me, that's valid. My story might not resonate with you, but it is a real story and it really did get me to this point. So I'm 35, May 14th, that's my birthday. And I was born into the world to loving parents who do love me unconditionally. Hi, <laughs> She's so cute. <laughs> Brittany, your daddy was crazy about you, Khalad. Still is. Of course you are. Khalikamach <laughs> means I, I don't know how to say it in English. I'll eat you up. Like, yeah. yeah. But that unconditional love, well, it was expressed in a way that I think didn't always communicate to me that the love was unconditional. Sometimes growing up, it felt like it wasn't. And because I felt like it wasn't, it was internalized to the point where I ended up getting diagnosed in 2017 with borderline personality disorder. So I have BPD. I was recently diagnosed after 13 years of kind of being like, hey, is my brain broken or am I just crazy? The good news is that I'm now years into remission. I'm doing so much better. And with the right kind of therapy, you too can be better. But more than the borderline, because I think that's kind of a side quest to really what was happening within me all of my life, I think the main part of my story that I want to talk about today is the desire to unalive, because wanting to unalive isn't about wanting to end your life, even though I know that's what it is. It's about wanting to end the suffering that is your life. And I think that's hard for people to imagine because they look at you and they think they know you and they think like, how hard could your life be? And to be honest, even sometimes I have those thoughts of like, how hard can your life actually be though? And the truth is, is hard enough. Hey guys, welcome to today's video. So one of you on Tumblr recently messaged me asking me to talk about alopecia. You suffer from this ailment and you asked me to talk about it because you're really struggling with it. And you honestly wrote this to me about a month ago and I sat there and I was trying to think, why would this person write to me about something that I have not experienced personally? And then I got to wonder, maybe it was because even though we all go through different stuff, experiences, ailments, troubling things, we all have different ways of coping. Maybe you saw the way that I coped with my past trauma. Maybe you've seen the way that I've taken other people's, you know, sad stories and tried to turn around to be a little bit more positive. Maybe you just really fucking felt like I was the person who needed to answer this for you. The truth is, is that you have a thing that is so unique to who you are, but not so unique that other people don't share it. You are going through an experience that you can actually relate with other people. There's a YouTuber called Hey it's Shannon, and though I don't watch her content, she actually has alopecia too. And she wears wigs and she talks about the struggle and talks about losing her hair. And it's such an interesting concept to me to watch her experience, not her content and what she's like, not her like beauty stuff, but actually watch her, the person. So many of us are, 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 our hair means something. And you know what? I've shaved it off twice just to prove to myself that I wasn't defined by it. But I don't have something separate from my stubbornness taking it away from me. And I'm sorry that you have something that takes away something that you want or love or think you need. 
And I'm sorry the society might judge you based off of it even before they've known you or your story. But I think after this last week from watching my content or reading the comments associated with my content, we have all hopefully come to the consensus that we all struggle and that's okay. That every single one of us isn't defined purely by our struggle, but what we do about it. God, that sounds so cheesy, like a Hallmark card right off the shelf. But one thing that I will say about humans is that you never know what's going on behind the mask. Like right now, I had a wonderful birthday weekend. I have great content, great supporters, amazing people. You guys showed up. Thank you so much to my live show on Friday and helped raise almost $158 towards the new computer, which will help me dish out content faster to you. And every day I go to sleep, I make a list of reasons to wake up in the morning. And that sucks. My, my, as Catholics would say, cross to bear is my is my trauma, my depression, my mental illness, my need for ending my life and always remembering not to. Yours is your alopecia. And I know that sounds such a like a weird maybe correlation, but for me it makes so much sense that every night before you fall asleep, you should remember that you have reasons to wake up in the morning. That no matter your struggle, whether it's being someone you don't want to be or looking away, looking at, you know, physically in a way that you don't think is the greatest. If it's something you don't have control over, I think that's the hardest thing to move past because you want to have control. People tell you, especially in America, you should be responsible for your individual issues, but they forget that those issues come with baggage sometimes so heavy, we don't have the strength to lift them up and carry them along with, uh, along with us on our journey. But don't worry, because you're not alone. I mean, that's the crazy, wonderful part. That even though you walk amongst all these strangers, there's somebody in the world with baggage almost similar to yours. Never going to be the same. But almost. It's like different shades of pink. You ever, do you know those people like myself who have like 10 different pink lipsticks? And you think to yourself, how many pink lipsticks can you have? Before you realize, they're all different shades of pink lipstick. They genuinely are uniquely pink. If you're thinking about unaliving, it's hard enough. There are so many people in the world that never, ever, ever think about unaliving themselves. And we need to consider that sort of a point of data. Why are these people existing in the world and never think about it? Could their suffering not be that bad? Well, instead of comparing the suffering... I think we should just pay attention to how we internalize and express that suffering. I've noticed that throughout my life, because I'm neurodivergent, because I was diagnosed with borderline, because I come from this really, really passionate Middle Eastern family, that a lot of the suffering was sort of um, a competition. There was a competition for suffering. And I know on my channel, we talk a lot about suffering wisely because I think it is so easily easy to suffer unwisely. And I think when we suffer unwisely, we internalize and take on baggage that wasn't even ours to carry. So here I am, this person living her life. I have this unalive age, 35. I think to myself, okay, if I don't figure it out, I'm just going to unalive by 35. I spent money like I was going to die. I was reckless like I was going to die. I didn't invest in my life because I figured I was going to die. I basically did everything possible throughout my life to guarantee that I would be falling behind by the time I reached 35. And now at 35, I'm doing pretty well at the catch-up game, but I am catching up compared to somebody else in their 20s who never desire to unalive, who maybe invested in their education, invested in their house, invested in their life, invested in their Roth. I never did any of those things. And I never really thought to. I worked my whole life. I paid my way. I did my adventures. I lived a full life. I'm still living a full life, but... I never really invested in myself. And so I think now that I'm 35 and I'm here and there's so much joy to be had in my life and I'm so happy, it's weird to think of me not investing in my life. But I think I did in a way. All of the searching I did, all of the attempts I made on my life, all of the bad relationships, all of the bad spending, I think was my attempt at living. I look back now and I think to myself, why didn't I ever follow through? 
And I think the attempt to unalive is message enough to yourself that something is wrong and more than that, that you don't really want to die. I think people take for granted how many people who desire to unalive don't actually want to die. They just want to end the suffering. And I think subconsciously throughout my life, I was finding ways to not actually follow through with my unaliving. I just didn't process it that way. And I think throughout my life when I heard the criticisms of, why do you want to unalive? Your life is so good. Why would you want to do this? I don't understand. You're so entitled. Why is this? You get all this feedback from the world that's telling you, you should want to live. And while they're telling you that, they're suffocating you and making you more miserable. And they're literally creating reasons to unalive. The irony, and I say this all the time, is the road to hell is paved in good intentions. Every time someone Not everybody, but a lot of the people, the way they would encourage you to not want to unalive was another reason to take the plunge. They insulted you. They told you you were titled and spoiled. They said, you know, why should you complain? What, what What has ever happened in your life that's so hard? It's not about what is, you know, the hard things in life. It's about whether or not you believe in yourself enough to overcome those things. And so I think every time I attempted to hurt myself or every time I attempted to unalive, I was proving to myself time and time again that I was tough enough to handle it, ironically enough. Now, I'm not saying I encourage you to self-harm. I would actually say the opposite, that I encourage you to stop self-harming. But I would be lying if I didn't admit that that path, that journey into self-harming wasn't also the data I needed to prove to myself that I was strong. Hello ladies and dudes. Yes, I'm eating bread. No, it's not a sandwich. And this possibly could be very bad for me. Today, I wanna talk about self-harm. Thanks to someone who was anonymous and sent me a message on Tumblr asking me my opinion on self-harm. Now, I asked them, what specifically do they mean by self-harm? Because so many things come to mind. Also, this bread, as I'm sitting here, and I had no plan to say this in the video, but as I started eating this huge loaf of French bread, I know, I'm a fatty, I realized A lot of people can consider this self-harm because of the lack of restraint towards all those carbs, the fact that it's probably not good for my body, especially since I never, ever, ever work out. And I don't know how my metabolism has worked the way it has, but thank God I still weigh under 120. But with that said, is this self-harm eating this piece of bread? Moving on from that, we're obviously not here to talk about bread, but the idea of self-harm is really intriguing to me, mostly because sometimes... I like to be spanked when I'm naughty. As you guys know, I dabbled in alternative communities and as I was in those alternative communities and I was engaging in consensual, organized, um, you know, very thoughtful moments of mm, challenges. I don't know how to say this. It's like, so the normies would run a Tough mutter or maybe a marathon, but the queers and the neurodivergence and the underground, well, we did BDSM, okay? Okay, we might not have been running marathons, but you know, at the end of the day, you're still shitting yourself. That's a joke. That's a little bit of a joke because marathon runners shit themselves. I never shit myself. But the point is, is that you challenge yourself to the point where your body breaks down to sort of reassuring yourself that you're capable. So whether you're running marathons or you're doing a consensual BDSM scene, ultimately, I think the psychology is the same. What am I capable of? How can I challenge myself? And how do I get better? I think in life we talk about wise and unwise suffering. We talk about the thing that makes us a person and that is our overcoming. But more than that is having a symbiosis or a symbiotic relationship with the consciousness, right? Going into your nature, having one with the self, making sure that you are understanding yourself instead of burying yourself in the data. I've noticed that a lot of people, and I think this is an issue of introspection, do things, experience a life, and don't learn the lesson. I think I'm grateful that I had a brain that was curious and interested in learning the lesson that life was trying to teach me. And I knew in my gut I was trying to learn something. I just didn't know what it was. And I was learning to live. I was learning how not to unalive myself. And when you're trying to learn how to not to unalive yourself, it means you sort of have to trial and error by trying to unalive yourself. I smoked a lot. I smoked a lot of marijuana in my life. No regrets, right? But it's still a version of smoking. I've smoked some cigarettes as well. (laughs) Rebel. I've drank. I've, you know, I've dabbled in drugs. I've done things. And all of them were pretty, I mean, I think I dabbled pretty responsibly. But I also 
just was irresponsible in the sense that I wasn't planning for my future. But what was the point of planning for a future I was sure I wasn't going to have? At 30, I made the decision not to unalive myself. And that was a good decision. But the decision was made with the understanding that I was sort of an evolved animal on the planet. I found my meaning. I dabbled in my curiosity. I made a decision to stop being toxic. I made a decision to aim to be better. And I don't mean temporarily. I mean permanently better. And so to dabble in toxicity again, to try to be unhealthy, to allow myself not to plan for my future like I wasn't allowed to anymore. It's not that I'm not human and I don't have moments. It's that I wasn't allowed to think, oh, well, I'll just unalive later. I don't have that option anymore. I don't have the option anymore to say like, I'll just unalive later. When you don't have the option to unalive, you have a new sense of duty to the self. But ironically enough, when I allowed myself to think you could just unalive yourself, I also gave myself hope. So now I'm 35 and I have a different relationship with looking forward to the future. When I was in my 20s and I made a deal with myself that I could unalive myself if it got too hard, but I could, I had to wait till I was 35, I gave myself sort of an allowance. I gave myself a sense of freedom to try as many attempts at living as possible But if I failed, I could always unalive myself. But by giving myself that opportunity, that sense of freedom, I also got to the point where I no longer wanted to unalive myself. And I know that if 35-year-old Brittany had told that to 22-year-old Brittany, she would have been very doubtful. She would have reached this point. I mean, gosh, there was a time in my life when I couldn't forgive people. I was so bitter. I was so angry. I just, I just was so lonely. Just so important. (laughs) And I don't know why it seemed like I should share this with you. But as I sit here, alone in my apartment, I just wish somebody was here to kind of sit with me, or hold me, or laugh with me, or watch Harry Potter with me. And as much as I love my space, because I do, I need people. I need to know I can walk out of my house and there can be someone there. I don't even care if I just have to go to a Starbucks and sit amongst a crowd of people who are ignoring me. Just to watch people laugh together. Hold hands. Talk about going on Indiana Jones-like adventures. That alone reminds me how beautiful and wonderful Life can be because there is love in it. And now at 35, I have no desire to unalive myself, though I have desires of always wanting to reprieve sort of temporary pain, like I have fibromyalgia and it's stress and there's life and there's all these things that make life sort of... (gasps) But then you remember that that is life. And yet in the suffering, when done wisely, it's kind of beautiful. I think it sounds a little too optimistic and probably a little too hopeful for people that are truly at their lowest to kind of think of their highest. But as a person who feels like she's experienced both, there is nothing like the high and there is nothing like the low, but the low could never compare to the high. I think I heard Dr. K say this before in which he said, you know, in life when people are in recovery or they're getting better, there's always this fear that they'll lose a part of themselves. You see this a lot with stand-up comics, but he's never met anyone who after getting better regretted getting better. And I think that that is the message I have for you as well, is that as much as there's a part of you you will lose, you will gain an understanding of yourself that you will never regret gaining. So being healthy and being joyful and not wanting to unalive isn't like losing a part of yourself that matters. It's putting that part of yourself into context for something greater and better. So here I am at 35. Um, I found the love of my life. I'm living in Europe. Indiana Jones is still alive. My cat, she's thriving. I get this podcast. I have this YouTube channel. I have this community. I have this dream that I wanted as a child, which was to talk for a living, to express myself with words, to have a community, to have somebody to share my life with, to have an animal companion, to have the ability to be an adult with a childlike wonder, to be a person who could be reliable while still having boundaries, 
to be an older sister that was capable and sort of still there for her siblings while still maintaining boundaries, to be a daughter that had a relationship with her parents while still maintaining boundaries. <laughs> I think throughout my life, one of the reasons I wanted to unalive the most was because I didn't have boundaries. Parents to know that their kids depend on them. And it's so vital for you guys to understand that as much and as scary as it is for you to find out that you've raised a kid who's different than what you thought they were, it's so much scarier for us who are young, emotional. You know, teenagers, we're freaking weird when we go through stuff like this. And now it's 21. You know, I complained a lot to myself that my parents never were the adults and because they were too busy worrying about other things and I had to be the adult. I had to watch my sanity. I had to worry about myself. And now that I'm older, I can't complain anymore because I've chosen to be that adult and to be responsible for my own sanity. It's been quite the journey for me and I'm still on it. Not everyone can say no to the gun or the noose or the pill when it seems so easy to use any method it is any method to exit this world. I didn't know how to tell people no. And if I told people no, I didn't know how to do it without rejecting them in the meanest and harshest ways. Of course, that could have been the borderline, but my need for space was so confusing to me. When was I allowed my own space? When was I allowed my own choices? I grew up in a very loving home that was very complicated because the way they loved you was rough, bro. It was rough from banning you from wearing shorts above your knees to criticizing every time you gained a little bit weight to asking you why you're contributing to the end of the world because you vote a certain way to assuming that if you're queer, you're going to be a predator to all of these things that you internalize as a child growing up only to figure out like, oh, this is just someone's belief. Belief is so powerful. We create religions. Belief is so powerful it actually impacts your brain. Stress is a killer. You are so powerful as a person, you can create constructs to build whole societies. And so I think sometimes as an individual, you feel so weak at the sight and the weight of the world only to realize you are so powerful. You have the ability to make your life different, but you need boundaries. So we say often on this channel, I'm open, but I have boundaries. I am open, but I have to have my boundaries because sometimes in life, the greatest people, your community, the greatest people, your loved ones, sometimes express their love in a way that is suffocating. The world can feel suffocating. And I know for all of my life, I wanted to unalive because I felt suffocated. I mean, who wants to feel suffocated? Have you ever felt suffocated? Has anyone ever held you down and covered your head or have you ever been trapped under a cover growing up or you ever been like playing with friends and someone holds you down or someone pulls you down in the swimming pool? It's not a good feeling. Now imagine that feeling throughout your life just living your regular day. It's not a good feeling. And in order to not feel that feeling, I had to decide that I was going to live my life with boundaries, very strict boundaries, loving boundaries coming from a good place, boundaries, but boundaries. So at 35, one of the main reasons I've decided not to unalive myself was because I figured out boundaries. I don't tell people what to do their life. I tell myself what to do. I don't put ultimatums down and I certainly don't threaten people. I do not, because those are the three choices. You can either have boundaries, ultimatums, or threats. I only have boundaries. Boundaries save my life. And more than that, I think it saved my relationships. Hello, ladies and dudes. Welcome to my creative bubble, which is very unorganized at the moment. Happy holidays and Merry Christmas, depending on what you celebrate. Today, I want to talk about experiencing life. I was recently in Hawaii visiting relatives for a couple weeks, and I had maybe one person tell me, you were really experiencing life going to Hawaii. And I thought that was really funny because I noticed that people only say you've experienced life when it's something really positive or exciting or you're traveling or whatever else. And the reality is, is that the world is so small thanks to technology that we experience life in so many different ways. And we have to inhale the oxygen that we can and experience life for what it is. And life is a wonderful mixture of horror and beauty. And we have to, at every moment of our life, acknowledge that. You know, someone recently said on the news, of course, that this generation was the worst and that we're so violent and less giving. But the reality is, is that 
in terms of reflecting upon history, we are the most peaceful we've ever been in the whole world. We are the most giving we've ever been in the world, and we are the most connected. We are experiencing life in a way that no one has ever done in history. I can communicate with people across the world thanks to the internet. I can travel the world thanks to technology. I can hop on a plane and go anywhere. I am experiencing human existence at a most unique time in the world and in history, and I am totally grateful for that. So when you want to experience life, realize that you are experiencing life the moment you wake up and the moment you go to bed. Every moment of your life is experiencing life, even if it feels like you're missing something, or even if it feels like you're just stuck at home or living with your parents, or you can't get a job you want, or you can't get the money you need, or you can't do the things you want to. That is your life you're experiencing. Doesn't mean it has to be good or bad or, or wonderful or horrible. It just means it is what it is. We are what we are. We are just here. And this is our life experiment. This is us experiencing life. That is the thoughts that have been through my head the last couple of days. And it's something I actually have to always remind myself so I'm able to cope with the horror of existence because it really gets to me sometimes. So moving into this part of the story, I'm going to be very transparent. <sighs> I think if I'm being honest with myself, I think I'm embarrassed about times in my life in which I didn't exhibit the best behavior. I wasn't the kindest. I don't hold on to that attachment, to that embarrassment, but I know that it took a while to get over it. In the journey of recovery, when you get to the point where you want to stay alive, there comes a moment where you also have to face all of the things that you did that were embarrassing because they were. You probably did some things that weren't the greatest and you probably should apologize to some people. But more than that, I think you need to apologize to yourself for treating yourself so badly because I treated myself very badly. I abused my body. I didn't take care of myself. I didn't sleep enough. I certainly didn't drink enough water. But more than that, I allowed myself to be neglected to the point where I think it eroded my relationships. Not all of them, not most of them, but enough of them. And I think my life could have been very different if I didn't do that. Now, of course, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have ended up here and I wouldn't have married the love of my life and I wouldn't be living the best life I've ever had and all of this, you know. So it's not about living with regrets. It's about acknowledging that at one point, your future self is going to be looking back at you, whatever you're doing right now, and this is going to be a memory that they're going to have to remember. So if you're living a life right now in which your future self isn't going to want to remember, maybe use that as a catalyst to do something different. It's not about regret. It's not even about holding on to the embarrassment. It's about letting go of the attachment after you've acknowledged how you feel about it. I'm not proud of my toxic moments but I'm so proud of where I've ended up. There's no way my life wasn't going to end at 35 if I didn't get my shit together. But getting my shit together <clears throat> had so much to do with my why. Why am I here? Why do I believe the things I believe? And why do I even want to keep being alive? You know, for the people who have never wanted to unalive themselves, I'll be real, that's awesome. I love that for you. Not relatable though. I'm sorry, as a person who's wanted to unalive herself since she was eight years old, I could never imagine living a life where I never thought about it or attempted or even read posts about it or dreamed about it. So if you're in a position where you're thinking about unaliving, that's relatable. Hello, ladies and dudes. Um, <laughs> it has been an interesting few days. I know I left you guys uh, with a kind of light video, a Q&A, and then I posted on Facebook reaching out to my community about helping me with kind of the doubts in my head, but also the depression and the anxiety. And so today we're going to talk about like me and uh, I guess in order for you guys to get to know me a little bit better and more on a personal level, um, I know a lot of you guys are new. I know a lot of you guys don't exactly know me um, from way back when. But I have been on YouTube a really long time, and I have gone from being a crazy conservative to the leftist I am now, but I've also 
oh my god, I've had to come to terms with my depression and anxiety, and for a very long time, I thought I wanted to kill myself because it was just kind of logical, and in some ways, it sort of still is, and I'm not really sure if that's the depression talking or if that's the fact that, like, we don't have a choice if we exist, we're brought into this world, and then we're just told to, like, good luck, have fun, you know? And I think that's really difficult for some of us to handle, and I don't... And it's really interesting with me because a lot of my... A lot of my struggle is beating myself up. But also, it is a decision you're making with yourself. You're making an agreement with yourself. Now, I understand that sometimes we have impulses and sometimes those impulses come so quickly, we don't even know what happened. But if you're in a position where you're not in an impulse moment, I really want you to know that you can have the life that you want. You just got to learn what game you're playing. And more than that, you got to learn why. Why are you doing what you're doing? You know, around 30, I had this realization that I needed to make a decision. I need to figure out my values and I need to figure out my why. Get in the camera. Say hi. Say hi. Say hello. All right, I'll let you go. That is Indiana, Indy, Anna. She's a girl and she's adorable. And I just adopted her. She's a little over three years old and it's my first pet on my own as an adult. It's an amazing feeling adopting something and offering it a home and peace of mind like she sleeps in bed with me uh and she you know she's fucking adorable I love her I am so blissfully happy in this moment I am so content with where I am in life you know I like my job I like my atmosphere I like my kitty cat I love everything I'm doing there's only one area in my life that I'm honestly, not only neglecting, but feeling so lost in. I am so lost in my ability, I guess, to write. I haven't read a novel in months. I haven't sat down to rewrite and edit a short story that I had written and people had read and I knew needed work. I've lost my voice. There was a time when I was busting out things of, you know, novel oriented things or writing pieces and I felt so secure in my voice but now I feel lost and a lot of that has to do with being consumed and so happy in other areas and I keep telling myself that I don't necessarily feel a need to rush into the writing world like I don't feel this need to rush into publication before I'm ready you know I've self-published books and Frankly, at times when I wasn't ready and I didn't have a voice and now I'm very much trying to find that voice. And so I guess my note today or my train of thought is to always consistently work at what you want to do. But if you have the luxury of not rushing yourself into an industry until you're ready, then don't. But maybe, just maybe, you need to build and perfect who you are as an individual and your talents in that industry before jumping in. And maybe that's an excuse I'm using so I don't have to work so hard in writing. Or maybe that's truly what I'm trying to do is work on myself. And I think that's why philosophy is so important because it teaches you through reasoning and data how to let go of that attachment of needing life to be something that it isn't. Because life is a cage that we create. It's a construct. Life has its own natural limitations, but more than anything, it is our nature to limit ourselves, to keep ourselves safe, and to trap ourselves. So having the balance between I'm going to put down a cage to keep myself safe and I'm going to put down a cage to trap myself is what is so hard about it. Throughout my life, I wanted some sort of a cage. I wanted a cage so badly, I went into the BDSM community, which no regrets, I love the BDSM community. But I wanted a cage. I wanted to feel safe. I wanted someone to protect me. And I realized like I needed to construct this cage. I met a BDSM couple years ago who told me that the role of a dominant and the role of a submissive is to have a symbiotic relationship. One in which they work together, that nobody is better than the other, that being a dom doesn't make you better than a submissive or a submissive worse than a dom. But more than anything, that the dom's responsibility in this particular relationship was to create some sort of fencing around a field of grass in which their submissive could run around. But then when they reached this fence, they would know not to go beyond it. Now, this was a 
negotiated consensual relationship between the dom and the sub, the submissive specifically asked the dom, build me a ranch. This is a metaphor. Build me a ranch. Build me something safe. Make me feel like a horse in the wild. But eventually there's like this gate that's going to keep me safe. And that really internalized. I really internalized that. That really said something to my brain where I'm like, okay, I need to put down the fence. I need to recognize that I can be this little sprite, this little Miyazaki Totoro. I can be this little keys delivery service. I can be this little Howl's Moving Castle. I can be Sophie. I can be running around, but I still need to put down boundaries. But why did I need to put down boundaries? Well, so I wouldn't unalive myself. And so the world wouldn't make me feel so suffocated that I wanted to. I, Brittany, really love, I love existing. I love breathing. I love drinking. Not alcohol. Juice. This is juice. I'm actually not a big alcohol fan. I don't like the taste of it now. I like my cat. I like my life. I like my work. I love my work. Oh my God. What a dream job. I love my work. I love flowers and I love the ocean and I love the sun and I just love being. So why would I want to unalive myself? Why did I feel so suffocated by the world? And I think it's because the world is truly like a moving energy. You remember in Spirited Away how there's that scene where No Face is like running after Chihiro? He's like running and con trying to consume her. She does this thing where Chihiro's moving through the story and she's in her existing. And she sees no face and that's her existence, everything outside of her. And she gives him a moment of her time, humanizes him, shows him love that he hadn't gotten from the world. And in return, he attempts to consume her. Now Chihiro, because she's a compassionate character and compassion means to suffer with, recognizes that suffering in no face. And instead of destroying him, kind of, allows him to live out his misery, helps him move through his misery, helps him vomit out his misery, and then moves forward in having a relationship with him where she teaches him balance and boundaries. Instead of becoming consumed by Chihiro, Chihiro teaches No Face how not to be consumed by existence, which is her, she's his existence. I think the world feels like No Face to me sometimes. It feels like I look at the world and I'm like, Hi. And then the world is like, are you paying attention to me? And then the world wants to consume. And maybe it's also partially because I'm a content creator. It feels like sometimes you try to just wave at somebody and that opens up a path for them to sort of like, I want to always practice this balance between being an existing and existence and making sure that I know why I am here and know what boundaries to put down so I can wave at people without them wanting to consume me. Now, I can't control people and Chihiro couldn't control No Face. But what we learned through her interaction with him is that if she did what was right in her regard, it would be right in his when we act within our nature, we are putting things right. Marcus Aurelius talks about this in meditations, but when man works within his nature, is one with his nature, the world is slightly more right. I think I look at the world as like this chaotic little bubble, like this whole universal bubble. But when things act in accordance with its nature, things sort of move within reason. There's a cohesiveness to it. I think that's internally happening in all of us where we're always fighting this sort of like battle within ourselves because we're biological creatures, we're most likely evolved animals over time. We're having a relationship with this chaos. Our bodies aren't always our friends. And more than that, sometimes even our intrusive thoughts certainly aren't our friends. And so it's about understanding all of those little micro universes that are happening within life from the universe down to our planet, down to our country, down to our communities down to ourselves. I can't even imagine unaliving at this point in my life. But I'm only five years into not wanting to unalive myself compared to wanting to do it for, what, a couple of decades? I wonder what my life will be at like at 40. And now that I've decided not to unalive, I'm going to find out. And I'm so excited to find that out 
but I don't think it's going to be without suffering. It's just going to be within wise suffering. And that is the game changer that absolutely made life go from unbearable to joyful. I remember in my 20s, I called my mom once. I was I moved out of the house. I was living in a rented room in Orange County. And I remember crying every single day on my bed, just fetal position, hitting myself, scratching myself pulling out my hair, just hating my life. I was working. I was a part-time YouTuber and a part-time grocery store worker. And I remember calling my mom and just saying, I'm so lonely. I'm just so lonely. And I remember her saying like, why are you lonely? You have this whole family. But I'm like one of those people who always felt so alone in a room full of people. Because not only could they not see the parts of me that mattered, I didn't accept that they couldn't see them. I think in life you learn that people see the parts of you they're meant to, and that alone is profound and beautiful. But I think we go through life being told like, oh, these people love you, they should see all of you. But if they could see all of you, girl, I don't think we'd like that. I don't think we'd like it the way we think we would. The only person I've met who could see all of me is my husband. The only person who makes me feel um, similar to when I feel alone is my husband, alone in a good way. Like when I'm alone in my best, I feel that way when I'm with him. I'm happy for him to see all of me. And I now see the difference between that and accepting the partial seeing that people give us. I remember being so lonely because I couldn't understand why it felt like everybody else was having these amazing connections and amazing friendships, but they weren't. They were struggling. They were lonely. And the loneliness epidemic that is happening now is a reflection of that. Nobody's having a fantasy. We're all just living in reality. And the reality can feel like a dream, but it is because it has been orchestrated by you. My life feels like a dream. I have everything I've ever wanted. I feel like I attained everything I ever wanted. My mental health is great. My finances are good. My life is good. My friends are good. My family's good. Things are good. But none of those things would have been good unless I myself was content. This is why I don't believe in this idea of like money will solve all your problems. Because like if you're depressed in a Toyota, you're going to be depressed in a Bentley, okay? Okay. At the end of the day, none of this would have been as rewarding if I myself weren't joyful in who I was. Even if my family was good, even if I had the great apartment, even if I met my partner, something would have been missing. There would have been a hole inside of me that would have kept me feeling like something wasn't right. And that still would have been about me. So unaliving is a combination of how you feel with existence and more or less how you feel about yourself. And that's why I think you have to have a relationship with existing, so yourself, and existence, everything outside of yourself. I think it's why I really recommend and encourage people, and I'm going to say this with a grain of salt, to consider that the bubbles they exist in might not be the best environment for them even if that's where your loved ones are, even if that's where your job is, even if that's all you've ever known. Because all you've ever known is making you crazy. All you've ever known is making you want to unalive yourself. And I need you to know, because it's what I needed to know, there's so much more out there. This thing you grew up in, this place you know, these smells that are familiar to you, these sounds that you recognize are just in this bubble. There are so many ways to exist, so many places to be, and so many versions of yourself that when you go to these new environments will be unlocked. I think we take for granted because I think we're on the internet, so we think we're really like, ooh, bubble, bubble hopping and bubble popping. I think we take for granted that the algorithm is serving us up something that's specific. You know, I laugh with my audience all the time. My Discord and I are always sharing videos and we're all watching the same people. YouTube is always recommending the same people to us. There are 8 billion people on this planet and we're all getting recommended the same 100 YouTube channels. 
So the internet's a great tool to pop bubbles, but even recognize that within that bubble, it's only curating certain bubbles to your attention. So I think we take for granted sort of not utilizing it and also thinking that it's giving us enough information. There's so much about life that is waiting for you to utilize it so you can uncover these things about yourself. So if you're thinking about unaliving yourself, I get it. But also, it's nice to no longer want to unalive myself. So if you want to stop unaliving or desiring to unalive, you got to figure out why. I think society, the part of society that doesn't want to unalive, they have such a hard time thinking, well, why would you want to? And I think it's just as valid to think, well, why wouldn't you want to? Because this assumption we're making that life is always worth living no matter what is only true if that's your reality. If that's not your relationship with life, then why wouldn't you have the opposite, you know, assumption that everybody wants to or everybody thinks about it? There was a TikTok I showed on stream of two girls talking about getting everything you've ever wished for. And the girl's like, that's what I would want from a genie, everything I ever wished for. And the other girl's like, oh, no, I couldn't get everything I ever wished for because, like, you know how sometimes you wish you were dead? And she's like, no. There are people on this planet that have never thought, oh, my gosh, I wish I was dead. Those people are amazing. But how could they ever see that part of you? How could they ever understand you? Which is why when people try to help unaliving people, people who want to unalive, it can become so frustrating because they're telling you things that don't make sense to a brain that wants to unalive. Which is why I said in the beginning of this podcast that the road to hell is paved in your good intentions. Every person, okay, who incorrectly tried to encourage me to stay alive only made it worse. Because they themselves could never have imagined a desire to unalive. So they tried to help me in ways that made it so much worse. They guilted. They made fun of. They bullied. They like, oh, I'm so disappointed in you. But honestly, can I be real with you? They were scared. They were so scared that I was going to do it and I was going to be good at it. I know that now that they were scared. I know that because of therapy. I know that because of philosophy. I know that because I know that fear is the root of all evil. Evil meaning furthest from joy in a philosophy sense. I know the people in my life that genuinely, genuinely, genuinely were trying to help me were so afraid that I was going to go through with it. And so I let go of my annoyance with them. I let go of my anger. I started to realize the love that I was looking for was there. I just didn't know how to process it. I am loved unconditionally. I am so, so loved unconditionally. I'm so lucky that I have a family that loves me unconditionally. And I love them unconditionally. And the thing as a family we have done over time is understand that. I think that that's been the hardest thing to realize and recognize in each other is that even though we disagree and we vote differently and all these other things, we love each other. If I could ask you to reflect on one thing, it would be how have people showed you love in a way that has been confusing to you but is real? And how have people showed you love in a way that is confusing to you and is not real? I think in life I had to learn what was the version of love that was temporary and what was the version of love that was unconditional. What was the version of love that I was experiencing that was kind of false? And what was the experience of love that I was experiencing that was true? Things that are true will set you free and things that are false will drag you down. And it was a false narrative that unaliving myself would be best. It was one I needed to cope It was one I felt was real and authentic, but it wasn't the truth in a philosophy sense. Unaliving myself would never have set me free. It would have relieved my suffering, though. It would have relieved my suffering, though. So now I focus on suffering wisely so I can be set free 
and not feel like unaliving is the only way to have a relationship with my suffering. Unaliving is not the only way to have a relationship with your suffering. But I can understand the reason why you it sounds like a good idea. Obviously, I really recommend therapy. I think therapy saved my life. DBT saved my life. Of course, I needed philosophy as well. I really recommend reading. Spotify currently has so many audiobooks. I'm not sponsored. I just love Spotify audiobooks. And I've been listening to them. I really recommend it. I just think the tools are there and it's a matter of getting them. And if I can help you get them, I'm happy to do it in the comment sections. Boundaries, okay? But I know what it's like to want to unalive. And I also now know what it's like to no longer desire to unalive. And it's, guys, I'm, tell, I'm telling you, it's the best. It's wonderful. It's fabulous. It's so worth it. It's so worth it to get to this point. So if you need any help, if I can give you any tools, let me know in the comment sections down below. And with that said, happy birthday to my Tauruses and my Geminis. Ooh, correct me in the comments, Geminis, right? I hope you guys have a wonderful May. I hope you have a wonderful birthday season. And I will see you guys next podcast. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me Cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, da, 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 da,